Hey, welcome back. So we've got some goals uh, in today's lesson. Uh, most of them relate to the periodic table. So they will relate to things that uh, really are just words that sort of describe position. Um, there are a whole collection of terms or key terms that describe the location of elements on the periodic table and how they have similarity with other elements. So sometimes we use the word group to do that. Many of these uh, terms are related to group. Remember the vertical columns. Um, so elements in the same vertical column uh, tend to have similar properties. They behave in very similar ways. Uh, so first thing we'll take a look at, what are some of the unique properties that differentiate metals between nonmetals? Uh, the second thing, a couple of key terms, uh, the terms malleable and ductile tend not to be everyday words. So I want to make certain that we briefly describe what they mean. And then we'll take a look at a, a number of these um, special groups or periods of elements. You're going to see some color coding on this periodic table on this slide that sort of begins to highlight that. But this lesson will um, eventually get to that. So let's get underway here with uh, our metals first. So metals have some properties. Uh, virtually, that means practically all of them are solids um, under what we would call normal conditions. Obviously, you could melt a solid. Uh, there is one exception, mercury. Uh, mercury is typically a liquid under the conditions that we have here on Earth. So uh, generally, we're talking about solid materials. Uh, they're both good conductors of heat and electricity. So metals are excellent conductors. Um, it allows us to use them in unique ways because of that. Uh, they have a high luster, which means they shine. They're shiny. So some people like to say shiny. Uh, technically, the scientific term is luster. They're both malleable and ductile. If you look at the diagram here, you will see malleable. You're going to see a hammer with what appears to be maybe like a fishing weight or fishing sinker that's been smashed. Malleable means when you strike with a hammer, it'll flatten out. So to flatten out by hammering is what malleable means. It allows us to shape metals to use them in uh, creative ways. Uh, ductile is a similar word. It relates to shape. It really uh, relates to the idea that we can take um, metal and form it into wire shape. So malleable means to flatten out by hammering. Ductile means to draw it out into wire shape. And our next term or next key property And this is what metals tend to do. They tend to give away their valence electrons. So it's a key property that will uh, eventually become very significant. So they like to lose their valence electrons. Remember, elements are unstable for various reasons. One of them is this thing called octet rule. So if an element doesn't have eight valence electrons, and of, of course there are exceptions, uh, they tend to give away or lose their valence electrons. So that's unique to metals. Counter, counter to metals, we'll look at our nonmetals and our properties, uh, they're either solids or gases. Uh, the one exception is bromine. So uh, it looks like there's always an exception, uh, just like there was an exception for metals, there's one exception for nonmetals. Uh, they're poor conductors of both heat and electricity, so they don't conduct well. They have a dull luster, they do not shine much. Uh, they're brittle if they're solids. That means if you were to strike it with a hammer, instead of flattening out and being malleable, it would probably shatter into little bits like chalk would if you were to smack a piece of chalk with a hammer. And finally, they don't hear, give it to me, baby. Or, that, excuse me, they do hear, give it to me, baby. So what they like to do is they like to attract valence electrons. So our nonmetal atoms tend to be unstable. And rather than giving away electrons to become more stable, they would attract or gain electrons. So that's a property unique to our nonmetals that is in uh, contrast to what we saw for metals. So let's begin to venture down the path of some of our special groups or arrangements. First of all, some of them are groups. Remember, groups are vertical. So all of these guys here in red are a group. All of these guys here in gray are a group, in blue are a group. So our vertical groups, um, they have the same number of valence electrons. 
And that's why we tend to say that they have similar behavior. The valence electrons of an element really do uh, affect its chemical behavior. Uh, so there are a number of different special groups, the alkali metals, the alkaline earth metals, the transition metals, the halogens, the noble gases. We're gonna take a very brief look at each one of these. Special periods going across. Down here at the bottom, there's a couple of special periods I'd like to mention. Um, so periods have the same number of energy levels or rings if we were looking at models. And that would be related to the period number over here on the side, periods one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There tend to be seven periods, but 18 groups. So our actinides and our lanthanides are our two special period names. Okay, let's begin to look at some of the ideas. Uh, so here is our first special group. Um, our first special group is the alkali metals, the elements found in group 1A. Generally, we exclude hydrogen from that, even though hydrogen is over here. It's only over here because it has the same number of valence electrons. Hydrogen's actually a non-metal. Um, it's a gas. So as a result, it really doesn't belong over here on the left side, but it's over here because it has one valence electron, just like all the alkali metals do. So interesting points about the alkali metals, they're the most reactive of all the metal elements. They behave like the chili peppers the most. They give it away, give it away, they give away their valence electrons the best. So they're highly reactive even with water. So I wanted to share with you a quick segment of video. Um, let me pause the, vi the video um, here so we can kind of cue that up. Okay, so this is gonna talk about the six different alkali metals. Uh, we're gonna notice that they all have very similar properties. Uh, first of all, they're all really soft. They could be cut with a knife. Uh, they cut much like a frozen stick of butter um, when you try to cut them with a knife. But uh, let's take a look at the properties of alkali metals here. This is a very accurate perspective of um, alkali metals and their reactivity. There are six alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. They're all soft metals which can be cut with a knife. In air, the elements quickly become coated with compounds that form on the metal surface. Highly Here, reactive. for example, is lithium. When we slice it, you can see the metallic luster. So it's the almost like it's rusting right before our eyes. We call it oxidizing. Sodium is kept under oil to prevent reaction with air. Again, when we cut it, the metal surface can be seen. But this time, corrosion occurs even more quickly. With the next alkali metal, potassium, the corrosion in air is so quick that it's hard to see the metallic luster at all. As we go down the group, the elements seem to react more quickly with air. Now let's see another reaction of the alkali metals, the reaction with water. We'll start with lithium. The metal floats on the water and reacts with it, giving up hydrogen gas. Now for sodium. The same sort of thing happens, although the reaction is a bit more vigorous. So you notice these are metals. They should sink when they fall into the water, but the reason they're not is they react so quickly with the water, they tear the water apart and they create what we call hydrogen gas. And that hydrogen gas allow, the hydrogen gas that's being generated allows like the little chunk of metal to behave like a rocket. As it's generating hydrogen from underneath, it's lifting it up and holding it on the surface of the water. We're not going to worry about the equation. Gas is produced, and the metal dissolves to give an aqueous cation with a single positive charge. Now for potassium. This time you'll see a flame. The heat given out by the reaction is produced so quickly that the hydrogen gas catches fire and is burned with a line of flame. So pretty cool stuff. It actually, this is a metal element that is flammable. If it comes in contact with water, we get a um, immediate flame. Um, and the reactivity of them changes as we move down the group. They get more and more reactive. So that was potassium. Um, and they're going to continue to show you reactivity of the next one in the group down below. The next element 
is rubidium. Rubidium. This time, we've put a safety screen between us and the reaction. You can see that the things gradually become more terrifying as we go down the group. So you can kind of guess when we go down to the next metal in the group, what's going to happen. The next metal in line is uh, cesium. Let's try cesium, our fifth alkaline metal. So pretty reactive stuff. Anyway, I wanted to share with you some of the um, ideas that uh, allow us to see the reactivity of the most reactive called the alkali metals. So our alkali metals highly reactive with water. That's unique. None of the other metals do that. So they're our most reactive group of metallic elements. So let's continue forward. So our special groups, our special periods, we looked at our alkali metals. Next, we look at our alkaline earth metals, um, group 2A, right alongside uh, where the alkali metals are. So the next group over. Uh, they're moderately reactive. Uh, they're a little less reactive. Uh, they're in group 2A. That means they have two valence electrons, so it takes more energy to give away to. That's one of the reasons that they're uh, a little less reactive. Uh, one thing that we know is they can form compounds that would neutralize acids. Uh, there's a chemical called calcium sulfate, magnesium sulfate, um, sometimes placed in these products that neutralize stomach acid, Pepto-Bismol, Mylanta, Tums. So our alkaline earth metals, they're moderately reactive, nowhere near as reactive as the alkaline metals. Continuing forward, we have a whole collection of group of metals. Um, this is lots of groups now, not one group. Anything that we call a transition metal has a group B above its group number here. So we'll have a B with the number. So it'd be like 3B, 3B, 4B, 5B, so on and so, so forth. Um, so they tend to be far less reactive. Uh, this contains all the precious metals, things like gold, silver, platinum. They're what we call transition metals. Uh, they have a unique quality that when they form a chemical compound, when they bond with other elements, they make some of these beautifully colored bright chemical compounds. Here's a chromium compound, um, a copper compound, a cobalt compound. So each of these um, tend to make more brightly colored compounds. You might be familiar with table salt, sodium chloride, right? Sodium's right here on the periodic table. It's not a transition metal, so it tends not to make a colored uh, type of a chemical solid when it bonds. Okay, our next group is what we call our halogens, uh, group 7A. So we're moving over to the non-metal side of the periodic table. And the most reactive of all the non-metal elements are the halogens. Uh, in Greek language, uh, halogen means halo, kind of meaning salt. Gen mean forming, so it means salt forming or salt formers. Um, sodium chloride has one of the halogens in it. It has chlorine in it. So the halogens, uh, group 7A, most reactive of all the non-metal elements. Remember, this reactivity relates to number of valence electrons. When they don't have octet or eight, tends to be rather unstable. We get to group 8A, I just talked about that idea called octet. Very stable elements. They have what we call a completely filled outer energy level that you and I have called valence level. So they're generally unreactive. They tend not to bond with other elements. Um, one of the unique uh, character, not characteristics, but one of the unique uses for these, they're sometimes used in what we call gas discharge lamps. You might know them as neon signs. Well, unless it's bright orange red, it's not really neon. If it's kind of a light uh, pink orange, it's more of a helium. If it kind of has this purple color to it, it's probably argon. So uh, the noble gases are generally unreactive and they're used in some interesting ways. Uh, we're just sort of touching the surface. But the idea is they're noble, they're special. They're special because they have octet. They have a completely filled valence level. Okay, uh, now we're gonna take a look at some of the things that we would call periods, not necessarily groups. One of the periods is called the lanthanides. It's the, this bottom of the periodic table, just the, the first row of the bottom. Uh, lanthanides have a few uses. Uh, one of them is uh, sometimes cerium, one of the lanthanides is a really important additive to metallic alloys that makes it very strong, gives it good tensile strength. So sometimes if you were to do this with a metal, you could bend it back and forth and actually cause it to snap. 
um, pretty easily. Uh, by adding uh, different metals, metals like cerium, we can kind of affect that tensile strength. Um, sometimes they're used in the manufacture of things like glass or lasers. So um, lanthanides, they have a location. And then our last grouping called the actinides. Uh, the actinides are all radioactive, very large nuclei, uh, something that we spoke about recently, last uh, unit. We talked about unstable atoms. Well, what causes that is a nucleus, a, a nucleus that has a ratio of protons to neutrons, usually when it's very large, uh, that makes it unstable, wants to decay, burst apart. So our radioactive decay, um, our actinides all do this. Most of them are artificially created, so they're created in um, a laboratory setting. Um, and as a result, um, you know, they don't generally exist in nature unless they have been created in a nuclear reactor. So um, there is one exception, this is the exception uranium. Uranium does naturally occur um, in the earth. So our actinides, our radioactive um, atoms, most of them are artificially created, and that leads us through the series of key terms that relate to positions on the periodic table. So uh, your assignment or follow-up assignment that relates to this will ask you to kind of work with some of these key terms a little bit, the alkali metals, the alkaline earth metals, the transition metals, the halogens, the noble gases, the lanthanides, the actinides, uh, to raise your awareness that they're really just words that relate to position, but they group together things that have common characteristics. That's the purpose of having those words. So we don't have to say these Johns on the bottom. Um, so we have terminology that allows us to speak about it. So until the next time, uh, hope you found this lesson useful for today's assignment. You'll be getting a copy of the notes that uh, coincide with this, that work with this. So use them to your advantage. And I'll talk to you very soon. Have a good day.